come in. So as you can see, I thought I'd turn the Happy New Year on its ear a little bit this morning. As I was thinking about, I was thinking about the new year, the trappings that we can get in when defining what makes us happy, we sometimes get so attached to the strategies we use to make ourselves happy um, that we can lose sight of what's right under our noses. And as I started to prepare for this talk, I was reading the liturgy for this week, and it gave me, if Bill hadn't given me push enough <laughs> to, uh, to put something together and be here this morning, the liturgy just threw me over the finish line with deciding to share um, something very personal and um, an extreme for the new year. So brace yourselves. <laughs> what I wanted to, uh, to just start with were some questions. And I should pause here and say, no matter who you are or where you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. So as we look at putting together New Year's resolutions, I wanted to have us ask ourselves with some reflection on where we've been in the past and where we're going moving forward that we center ourselves in the moment and ask ourselves some questions. What really makes us happy? What keeps us from happiness? In other words, what are we hanging on to? And of what are we letting go? We need to respond to slightly different questions like what assumptions are we making about ourselves and others that limit our connections and our sense of satisfaction? What would make you happy if you completely accept that you are enough? Of what could you let go if you accepted that you are love completely? So in one of the uh, inaugural programs of the Hind Center, I got to participate in a memoir writing class. And so what I decided to do um, is share some of that with you today. In Ephesians, today's scripture talks about transformation, about Saul's complete reinvention. We must be willing to lose it all to accept and take our place and our call. I'm not suggesting that each of us have some grand, remarkable, noteworthy place that's going to bring us all this attention and recognition. But what I'm saying is that we have to trust that we can wholeheartedly be transformed into who we were, as Richard Rohr says, before we were born. In Isaiah, we look at the release from fear and overwhelm. Look around, the prophet commands. God's light always shines through the darkness, and the reign of God prevails, even in the most dire of circumstances. This is what gives us hope. This is what helps us stand up to our fears. This is what gives us courage to go forth in the name of Christ and respond not with anger, but with grace and mercy. And in Matthew, we learn about the epiphany. Seeing and knowing Jesus in a brand new light is what we're called to do. When I hit my rock bottom eight years ago, I, I wanted to deny Jesus with every ounce of my body. I was so connected with the name of Jesus as being something that brought shame and guilt and fear to me um, that I just, I ran as far away as I could. But what I discovered after I hit rock bottom was that I could no longer deny 
Jesus, I could no longer deny the Christ in others because those who loved me most, who I'd hurt the most, showed me the kind of love that only comes from Christ. I had disintegrated into absolute nothingness, and yet I was met with that kind of love that recognizes the soul and renews, restores, and accepts the human that's carrying it around. This is the kind of forgiveness and acceptance that I discovered that brought Jesus to life for me. So, my life is completely different internally, but remarkably similar externally. I hit this rock bottom just a few months before I started coming to this class. <clears throat> I had, a, I had and have a husband, wonderful children, job, loving extended family, beautiful home, car, job with flexibility and autonomy and respect, then and now. No one could ever guess the internal turmoil, fear, despair, and self-loathing that were happening so loudly on the inside eight years ago. And they're nearly extinct today. Eight years ago, I had everything I wanted everything that I thought would make me happy, and yet I felt like a trapped animal. I perceived that I had very little control and choice in the things that mattered most to me. I was becoming more and more attached to the strategies that I thought were my only path to happiness. Others' opinions about me, their reactions, their feelings, all became more and more part of my perception that controlled my happiness. My performance, decision-making, efforts, and evaluation were heightening, um, and my satisfaction and self-acceptance were cratering. I held so tightly to these things that I completely let go of everything else. The life I was authoring became fiction. And then there was a turning point. A spiritual emergency. The dose of smelling salts that I got from hitting rock bottom is something that I must keep turning toward in ever widening and strengthening certain shrinking circles. My choices changed and my stability increased. My self-awareness and self-acceptance widened but yet I have to stay close to that event and tether myself to the humility and clarity and flexibility that that surrender brought me to God and put God at the center of my life. Rather, I have to keep my life centered on who I am in God, no more, no less. So I wanna read some of my memoir piece that I wrote recently. And I ask that you go on this journey with me to understand how different things looked for me just a few short months before I started coming here. The beginning is really hard to hear. But I hope that you'll see why I'm compelled to tell you this story right here and right now at the beginning of a new year because we each have the opportunity to stop and rewrite our stories each year, each day, and moment by moment. So I titled my piece, How to Burn Out a Really Hard Drive. <laughs> Here's my how-to piece. Accept that you can find a place in this career path that will accommodate your drive and willingness to work hard enough to overcome your lack of talent. Accept every challenge, work harder, longer, and take all praise as motivation to give more of yourself. Follow the dreams of your childhood and have ch children. Become the parent you always wanted to be. Regardless of what other women in your field tell you, believe that you can be successful in parenting and business. Conclude that your struggle is a sign of your weakness and laziness. Over-identify with masculine energy to gain as much ground as possible at work and at home. 
convince yourself that the only reason you aren't balancing and thriving at both is because you aren't good enough, not trying hard enough, or possibly both. Resist the urge to resent those around you who have time to be idle. Remind yourself that you would have time to rest if you worked hard enough or try hard enough, or possibly if you were enough. Stay up late, get up early, keep up with the demands of the pantry, hamper, inbox, classroom, wet noses, and the bathroom mirror. Come straight home and stand over the stove. Stare at the steaming pot. Turn up the heat and hold the lid tighter. Place a few more pots on the stove top and load the oven with casseroles. Heck, buy a second oven. Invite friends over to watch. Not satisfied? Get a hobby, a second job, buy more stuff, push for a promotion, travel on business, refuse to ask for help. Never ask for help. You might as well stand on your desk at your beige cu cubicle and yell, I'm a big fat failure. Never ever ask for help at home either. You're liable to set the entire female gender back 50 years if you ask for help. Tell yourself that drinking every night with other unhappy working moms is the best strategy. It's the only strategy to survive the pressure. Convince yourself that whining at your community will keep you going. The better it works, the bigger the bottle. Don't recognize the drop in quality of everything, the pantry, hamper, inbox, classroom, wet noses, and bathroom mirror. Drink until your body content is so liquid that your bones and muscles swish and slosh with every move and wider and wider arcs. Allow the cycle of expanding sways and constricting blood vessels become the rhythm of night and day. Let bad news increase the volume. The family dog passes a few more nightly glasses. Briefly stop drinking to support another face for the photo frames, another miscarriage, more violent fuel for the flames. Your father and grandfather have heart attacks. Enough, the vessel cracks. The next chapter is, thank you, you got through the hard part. <laughs> How to restore to factory settings. Wake up to the stippled concrete sidewalk texturizing your face. Wake up to the voice vibrating in your head, your bones, and your broken heart. Listen to your own voice crying out, emanating from brokenness like exposed vessels, bone marrow, and gray matter, pleading with God to finish you off. That is enough. That is it. Embody the rush of courage. Leave all fear behind. Put it all down. Lay it all out across the wide expanse of concrete in the heart of the dimly lit city. Throw it recklessly while no soul dares to interrupt your fall. Now, with both hands, follow me. Welcome me. Feel my presence. Engage each muscle and run. Run for your life. Not out of fear, despair, or confusion. Run with courage hope, and clarity. Run full speed into love, forgiveness, understanding, and joy. Run headlong into my grace. Run to the table I set for you. Share your joys with me. Share your burdens with me. Don't attempt to hide your anger from me. Sit with it. Sit with me. See me. See me in all things and everyone. See me in you. Hear me. Hear me in the hum of the highway, the beating of your heart, in the rustle of, the, of your shuffling feet. Feel me in every action and reaction. Don't judge me. Don't judge my actions. Don't judge me in you. Let me be. See me not in what you do, except me in your being. Take your corrupt file and carefully rewrite it as you learn to accept me in each word. Restore yourself always in our being one. And the third part, how to update your software. <clears throat> Accept that all will be well on this path, 
even if you can only see far enough ahead for one step at a time. Enlist your faith to overcome fear and put one foot in front of the other. Do not be afraid to say no if something doesn't seem consistent with your path. Do your angry jump rope dance, that is a thing, and yell at God when you're tired of not knowing where you're headed but you feel so propelled in a specifically unknown direction. Dance through each day fluidly, staying flexible and open-minded, allowing yourself to make grand, graceful, expanding arcs with the ebb and flow, with the tides of conflict and re reconciliation, with good and bad news, with the cycle of the seasons. Let life's challenges increase your resilience, patience, and acceptance. Twirl freely at the base of the wellspring. Flow with the endless source. Allow the cracked vessel to receive and give from this rich abundance streaming through the unique veins of your life. Know it is enough to observe the liquid and light as they bounce, shimmer, reflect, and refract. Restore yourself always in me. You are enough. Save often, you are loved, and there is nothing to undo, you are love. So, that was hard. <laughs> um, but I hope that I shared in telling the story in these three different sections was that as Christians, this contemplative stance is the third way. We stand in the middle, neither taking the world on from a power position or denying it for fear of the pain it will bring. We hold the realization, seeing the dark side of reality and the pain of the world, but we hold it until it transforms us. This is from Richard Rohr's Everything Belongs. <clears throat> so I ask us to look at these questions again for you because we all have our own story and we all have the ability to look at things differently. So what makes you happy? What keeps you from happiness? What are you hanging on to? And of what are you willing to let go? Spiritual practice to me is what helps keep that my centeredness and identity in God as much as possible in my awareness. Um, there are different methods, if you will, that memoir piece was really like a long awareness examine from the Ignatian exercises where we can look back at something dramatic like what happened to me and analyze it and sit with it and rewrite it. The awareness examine allows us to do that every day, three times a day. Um, we can make subtle adjustments. We can center ourselves. It allows us to recognize that we are loved and allows us to engage with each moment, which with this sense of being enough and being loved. And that is what I think changes the course of our lives much more so than the big story, but these subtle shifts and opportunities that we miss when we don't think we're enough or we don't feel like we're loved or we're being defensive or, you know, we, we're trying to control something. Um, so that's why I'm so passionate about spiritual practice um, is because I think it's that constant tether that puts us on firm footing um, that we all need to keep in our awareness if we're going to respond with love. Um, in our lives, our ordinary lives. So here are those questions again. What assumptions are you making about yourself and others that limit your connections and your satisfaction? What would make you happy if you completely accept that you are enough? What could you let go if you accepted that you are loved completely? Spiritual practice tethers us to God in un unconditional love and acceptance. 
It gives us freedom to bring centered and creative love into each moment. Let's see, there's one more, couple more things I wanted to read. In our Centering Prayer class, we're reading this book, Zen Spirit, Christian Spirit, um, and we discuss it after we do our centering practice. Um, because, because the fear of sin and the fear of doing anything wrong um, could just completely wind me in on myself, I like this discussion in the chapter on ignorance in this book. However much Zen Buddhists might speak of sin, their primary concern is not so much with the sin itself as with its primary cause, ignorance. Zen does not speak of original sin, but of original ignorance. It strives to enlighten that darkness of mind from which sinful actions come. Not unlike modern therapeutic theory, Zen tries to heal the mind that has been abused or neglected or so overly defended that it no longer perceives its original face. I thought that's a beautiful tie-in to what Richard Rohr says about who you were before you were born. And then one more thing I wanted to read. And this is a psalm that I thought tied in closely to um, the story I shared today. Arise, O beloved, in your steadfast love. Shield me from the demons within. Stay near me, heart of my heart, and I shall be strong to face my fears and illusions. Let all fragmented parts of my being gather around you. Help me to face them one by one. Love's healing presence will mend all that has been broken. I shall once again be made whole. I wanted to end by reading you my favorite children's story. <laughs> because to me, this speaks more about about spirit in the world than anything else. And um, our five-year-old has taken to reminding us of this quite often. The book is Wherever You Are, My Love Will Find You by Nancy Tillman. <clears throat> I wanted you more than you ever will know. So I sent love to follow wherever you go. It's as high as you wish it. It's quick as an elf. You'll never outgrow it. It stretches itself. So climb any mountain, climb up to the sky. My love will find you. My love can fly. Make a big splash, go out on a limb. My love will find you. My love can swim. It never gets lost, never fades never ends. If you're working or playing or sitting with friends, you can dance till you're dizzy, paint till you're blue. There's no place, not one, that my love can't find you. And if someday you're lonely, or someday you're sad, or you strike out at baseball, or you think you've been bad. Just lift up your face, feel the wind in your hair. That's me, my sweet baby. My love is right there. In the green of the grass, in the smell of the sea, in the clouds floating by at the top of a tree, in the, in the sound the crickets make, at the end of the day, you are loved, you are loved, you are loved, they all say. My love is so high and so wide and so deep. It's always right there, even when you're asleep. So hold your head high and don't be afraid to march to the front of your own parade. If you're still my small babe or you're all the way grown, my promise to you is you're never alone. You are my angel, my darling, my star, and my love will find you wherever you are. And I wanted to end with, 
and you carry precious cargo. <laughs> so watch your step. Did anybody want to do a Q&A or anything? Or actually a Q&R I like because I don't have the answers. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So Frida asked me, after I hit my rock bottom, what were the first steps that I took afterwards? This will fill up the rest of the time. <laughs> um, so some of the things that I left out of my story were the details about what got me into that um, situation, um, the, the downward spiral of decisions. Um, some of those decisions that I made end most marriages. I can confidently say that. So one of the first things that Eric and I did was we each got a union analyst. We, um, we realized this was not going to be marriage counseling for us. This was going to be, we need to rebuild ourselves and just see what's left. Um, and so we started seeing union analysts. We, uh, we started coming to this class. And in coming to Ordinary Life, we were exposed to um, nonviolent communication. Jim and Jory Mansky had visited um, from Hawaii. They might have been in New Mexico at that time. They're now in Hawaii. Um, but they... Uh, they introduced us to nonviolent communication. And this was the first time that I saw that I had needs. <laughs> like more than just those strategies that I thought were going to make me happy, like making more money and having more stuff and you know being the perfect mom. That expanded my view of just being a whole, what it was going to take to be a whole person and how I needed to look at all of those needs together. So that was huge and shifting. And shortly after that, we were introduced to Judy Wilbrat's Enneagram work. And those two things combined just expanded opportunities. Actually, the very first thing, that I'd forgotten about this um, because I talked so much about the other ones, the very first thing I did was read The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutler three times in a row, and that is not a small book. <laughs> But you can see I was really grasping at that point. And I read it three times. I bought the audiobook and I listened to the audiobook three times in a row. So six times cover to cover. And I think that what practice of meditation and Buddhism, the concepts there allowed me to do was to let go of the attachments that I had to my misunderstanding of Christianity. Um, and over and over again, I, I had to let go of this notion that I was never going to be good enough, that I was a bad girl, and all these things that were such limiting core beliefs for me um, that I had attached to Christianity. And so Buddhism practices allowed me to let go of those and to receive this grace that I had, had seen and felt at that rock bottom moment, but I could not understand at all because it did not compute up here. <laughs> You know, it made no sense to me. So that, that travel through, through um, the art of happiness with the Dalai Lama and beginning to, you know, grasp those concepts allowed that opening to happen. And Bill, you know, the way that Bill teaches about Christianity was just what I needed um, to begin to, um, to see the depth and richness that was there for me that I think is part of who I am. Um, but I just... I needed a safe place to see and explore that. Um, so those, the NBC and the Enneagram piece and a lot of um, spiritual practice um, really helped, I think, um, make the putting back together happen more rapidly um, than I think, I don't know how I would have, I don't know how I would be standing here without every one of those pieces. All right. Anybody want to know anything about any spiritual practices that I've tried? <laughs> so for me, I think because I had, I needed to let go so much. It, it those are um, uh, mind emptying practices and and centering prayer. Um, um, centering prayer is my number one go to, and I think it's because, um, as Thomas Keating puts it, when we when we have monkey minds, like we talk about, you know, we can't stop the thoughts from having, but that we have. Um, but as Thomas Keating describes it, 
when we bring ourselves back to our, our mantra or that word, it's an invitation to let God in. Um, and that we can, we don't have to feel guilty that we are having monkey mind. As he puts it, we have that more, that many more opportunities to invite God into our hearts when we're constantly going back to our word. So that, that one is my favorite. And I don't even think I could put words around why, um, except I know for me, this emptying, um, emptying practices because it was my attachments and my expectations that got me into so much trouble that for me it's the emptying practices that that mean the most i wish you'd asked me that about six months ago because <laughs> i've gotten a little out of practice lately i was there was a time when i was doing it morning and night 20 minutes yeah i actually um uh was doing it for 45 at one point 45 minutes um once a day and 20 minutes the other um but it's it's more of a it's more of a sporadic thing for me right now, but I really want to get into that practice again. Um, I've taken to doing the awareness examine at midday and before bed. Um, it's a quicker practice, but it allows me to keep track of ways that I turned away from love and ways I turned towards it and just making note of that. So that's, that's my second go-to. Um, and then there are all the ones that we practice in um, and conspire to that have a little bit more co-creating energy to me. Um, my, my perception of not being a talented designer or artist or whatever in that, in that world of, you know, where I came from in the corporate world, um, when I'm centered and empty, and allow myself the opportunity to write or paint um, and those kinds of things, those practices are really fulfilling for me too. Um, okay, awareness examine. Um, it comes from the um, Ignatian exercises and here's how I kind of describe it for layman's, in layman's terms, you know, is that um, what you do, the instructions are really simple you you sit quietly you center yourself you know you take you know how we do at the beginning of conspire we always sit and meditate for a few minutes we get ourselves in in a con contemplative state and then you rewind let's say you're doing it you're doing it at lunchtime you rewind the memories that you have all the way back to when you woke up that morning so you've just kind of taken a um a replay of your day up to that point, just going backwards. And you notice what were the moments that have happened today since I woke up where I turned away from love or where I turned towards love. Um, and, and then you settle into one of those moments and just let it, you know, kind of like when you do Lectio Divina, you re let it read you. You let that moment kind of read you and a lesson or a prayer will come out of that. And you just give yourself some time to sink in to that prayer. Um, and, um, and then you let that reflection and that prayer guide you into the rest of your day. And then you do the same thing at night. It really can take, you know, five or 10 minutes. But rather than going years into a certain pattern and then looking back on it years later this allows us to see where we're doing that um, for four or five hours at a time um, and I, I like that it, I think it can be very life-altering yeah so he's saying that there's one word that that describes that that moment of shift whether it's the big thing or the little thing or the little practices and that's surrender um, I agree with that yeah, that sounds right to me. Anybody else? Yes, Alice. So the question was, explain what I mean by love, turning towards love or away from love. And is that love with God or love with others and everything else? Um, <laughs> I always laugh when I do this, but I'm going to quote Jim Carrey. <laughs> um, 
there was a speech that he gave and he said that the moments of our lives could be defined by um, whether we are choosing love or fear. And, and to me, when I do the awareness exam, and that's what it is for me. I'm a six on the Enneagram and I struggle so much with fear and that's why I control and expectations and, you know, I could get so attached to those things. To me, what, what I know is the right next step for me is always choosing love. And so it's a preparation of being ready to see what that op opportunity is in each moment. Um, so love, um, love is, is namaste. It's connecting the Christ in each other. It's allowing the Christ in me to connect with the Christ in you, um, with the light in me to connect with the light in someone else. And, and we, make, we make choices, conscious or unconscious, um, that lead us towards each other and recognizing that in each other and choices that turn us away and make that not possible. And that's, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, there's a, um, there's a surrender. There's a surrender to um, the fear for me. And, um, and in the Enneagram, I, I think that was where I learned where faith was the, um, was what helped me let go of that fear um, because you know when you when you're so afraid all you're looking for are ways to protect you you know that creates a created a really big wall around me and narcissistically made me so wound up in myself um, and so faith was the way to let those layers go for me and, you know, getting struck in the head with a cosmic two by four, you know, made it pretty obvious of what I, you know, I needed to start over. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to try to summarize the, the two points um, is that, and that we hear many times in here is that um, we, we can look around and recognize God in each other. And that regardless, God loves us no matter what. And I, I, um, one of the things that I really um, enjoyed and really dug into was the cloud of unknowing. When I was going to the, um, to the cynical to get certified as a spiritual director, we each picked a piece of work or a saint or mystic to, um, to study. And I studied the cloud of unknowing. And one of the things that, um, that started to make sense to me in the cloud of unknowing was that he says, you know, it's sometimes it's the worst of sinners that get this message more clearly about not about um, seeing Christ in others and, and not judging. And honestly, I don't know how in the world I could possibly judge another person after what I've done. I mean, that that made this a really equal playing field for me. <laughs> and um so i you know i get that aspect of it you know um uh but it's hard it's hard for us um to connect that way with each other and i think those are two really good things to to remember yeah that um that when we have when we go through adversity so, sometimes we think that's you know the end of the world it's the worst thing that it could ever happen to us but once we've been through something like that and we come out on the other side, we realize that, you know, many times it's the best thing that could have happened to us. And um, there's a there's a children's movie that I love. Um, uh, it's um, called Meet the Robinsons, and it's about an inventor. And um, the family is this wacky, you know, group of misfits. You know, they don't fit our mold about, you know, perfect family. Um, but they have this saying when somebody tries something and it doesn't work, they say, congratulations on your failure because you don't learn anything when everything goes right. So, um, that's kind of like a, a mantra for us. Um, but we don't, we, you know, and I, I think, you know, having small children, I learn, I get to learn these lessons over and over and over again, but um, to me, being a perfect parent is not about getting out ahead and predicting what's going to happen and making everything perfect for them. It's about being with them, like Brene Brown says, you know, down in the pit and having empathy 
and being with them and feeling with them when things don't go right. Um, because um, to me, there's a lot better lesson in that than having the perfect life where everything falls into place because, you know, that's not going to last too terribly long in um, this unpredictable life that we have. All right. So you carry precious cargo. <laughs> so watch your step.